Global Entrepreneurship Week panel. This panel is called the Drink Debater because, um, well, I'll have Dr. Troy explain that. I think he, he'll do a better job than I could. But Global Entrepreneurship Week are events that happen all over the world and millions of people participate in entrepreneurship activities. And um, we usually have Startup Weekend during this time, but we moved it earlier this year. And this is the alumni panel. So last year's alumni panel um, is in that first picture. And thanks for being a part of this global movement to promote entrepreneurship. Um, this alumni panel features these people in which Dr. Choi will introduce. And without further ado, let's get started. All right, so are we starting? Are we visible to people now? All right, thank you, Darlene. Welcome everyone to the Global Entrepreneurship Week and our entrepreneurship alumni panel. Um, my name is David Choi. I'm the director of the Fred Kiesen Center for Entrepreneurship at LMU. We have an unusual event today very unusual and very, very fun event today. Uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very proud moment. I feel a little guilt at the same time. I don't know why, but um, I feel very, very uh, excited that we have uh, some of our most interesting alumni, actually, and a student as well, that all happen to be in the alcoholic beverage industry. A very, very uh, cool industry, industry I, um, I'm a consumer of. And uh, so it's, it's a very, very exciting time. I think we're going to have a really, really fun discussion. It's a industry where you can really combine your passion and, of course, your hard work and vision and all that stuff to really build an interesting business that a lot of people, uh, whose products a lot of people can enjoy. So today we've got one, two, three, five different companies represented. First one is uh, with Sophia Caslow and Jake Tannenbaum. These are the founders of Craftmix. And uh, we'll have them introduce themselves in a, in a second. We have Charles Nelson, President CEO of Nelson Greenbrier Distillery. We have Carl Soto, Carlos Soto, co-founder of Nosotros Tequila, Andy Fowler, co-founder of LA Los Angeles Ale Works, and our student currently still, Nathan Critchett, co-founder of Lum Spirit. All right, what I'd love to do is uh, have you guys uh, introduce yourselves. Let's start with, um, I don't know, let's start with uh, Andy. You know, when you guys introduce yourself, we, we have a lot of people, so make it somewhat short, but don't be afraid to um, brag about yourselves, okay? And 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 uh, and share some highlights of your business, okay? So Andy, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm Andrew Fowler. I'm one of the co-founders of Los Angeles Ale Works. Um, it's one of our beer cans here. Oh, I have one. Too, you drink it? <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, we're located in Hawthorne. Um, been around for about five years. I'm also a director at the Los Angeles Brewers Guild, uh, which is a nonprofit um, advocacy organization that represents independent beer and protects our interests from big beer and all the nasty distributors. Um, but yeah, excited to be on the panel tonight. Yeah. But you know, share a little highlights. So what 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 are you what are you proud of and, and how is the company doing? So we, we're doing well. We um, we were scheduled to open our second location this year. COVID derailed that, much like everything in the world. Um, yeah. But we, yeah, we've got 25 employees. Um, we self-distribute to 800 plus accounts, stadiums, grocery stores. Um, yeah, it's been a fun project. I mean, can't complain at all. It's grown a lot. What's happening? I don't want to jump right. What's happening with the second location now? Is it just on hold or is it... Uh... Yeah. yeah, so it's in this uh, half a billion dollar development and it's completely slowed down because of COVID. Um, yeah. So we're hoping the first quarter 2021, um, we're at the point where 
like the electricians can't use elevators so they're walking up and down <laughs> eight stories of stairs yeah. and yeah so i'll say it's kind of a blessing i think it'll be better and once there's a vaccine and things are more open and we've got the hbo headquarters are part of the building uh there's a high-end hotel there like 15 restaurants um so it's not really it's not built for covid okay i'm really looking forward to you, you uh getting it set up eventually and I'll, I'll, I'll go visit all right one of the most interesting stories of you know of uh, how a company a brand got started is probably uh, charles nelson nelson greenbrier distillery charlie could you mention a little bit about your business and uh uh, how you maybe how you got started and how's it's doing some highlights yeah uh so first of all thank you so much uh for having me on and I'm, I'm just really proud to uh to to be here and i on my on my luggage i have a, an lmu tag that i uh so i bring lmu <laughs> with me just about everywhere i go so i'm i'm just proud to be um you know an I, lmu I alum. You everywhere too here right <laughs> Nice. Uh, so I, I could I could probably go on for for a long time about our history and, and how we got started, but I'll try and make it brief. Um, my company, Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery, was started by my great, great, great grandfather, Charles Nelson, uh, came over to America with nothing but the clothes on his back and started a wholesale grocery business where he was one of the first to bottle and sell whiskey rather than selling it by the barrel or the jug. Uh, he created the original Tennessee whiskey and you know, was sell it was one of the largest distilleries in the country prior to Prohibition. It was kind of like the Jack Daniels of his era, shut down because of Prohibition. Um, and at the time was actually about 20 times the size of Jack Daniels. And uh, growing up, I didn't know about the distillery, um, but, uh, the summer before I, I studied abroad and, and uh, while I was at LMU and um, I took a little bit of time off. And then um, so the summer before my last semester um, at LMU, I, I was working in Nashville, Tennessee, and my dad went in with three of his buddies to buy a cow worth of meat from a butcher and invited my brother and I to go with him to pick up our quarter of a cow worth of meat. and. You know, on our way there, we were running low on fuel. We stopped to fill up, and at the gas station, there was a historical marker that said Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery, one mile east on Long Branch Road. Charles Nelson opened the Greenbrier Distillery. We were just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Go on to the butcher, lived a mile east on part of the land where the original distillery was, shows us across the street, then sent us to a nearby historical society where there were two original bottles with my name on them and uh, just been fell in love and been working on resurrecting the company ever since. I immediately finished my last semester, uh, took took a, a business class uh, one semester, <laughs> learned everything that I needed to know about business and um, moved back to Nashville, uh, started the the brand Bell Mead <laughs> Bourbon, which uh, you know, this is this is one of our labels. Um, yep. This one was actually a year or two ago rated as one of the top 10 whiskeys in the world yep. by Whiskey Advocate Magazine. And um, we're just really excited. We're about to, that that product's actually in all 50 states now as of very recently. And, and we're gonna be releasing this, our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey um, next year. Awesome. All right. so. Charlie did a little bit bragging, which is good. This is what I'd like you guys to do. Uh, brag about your business, okay? By the way, Charlie, how long have you been at it now? I've been working on it for 14 years. Okay. So. I think uh, you're the veteran here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for sharing the story. It's a, it's a freakish, awesome story, uh, you know? Uh, seeing your name and it turns out it's a great, 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 great grand grandfather. And then you decide it's, it's your destiny to uh, to start the business and go through all the uh, tough times and good times. Okay, we'll get to we'll get to you in a, we'll get back to you in a second. Okay, let's do uh, Carlos with uh, Noso Tequila. Of course. Um, well, hi. Uh, can, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. 
Uh, well, hey guys, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chair, for, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Carlos Soto. Uh, I'm originally from Costa Rica. I was born and raised over there. Uh, moved to California uh, for school. Uh, I was able to get a scholarship to come to LMU and it was an awesome experience. Um, Costa Rica is more of a rum country. Uh, so I grew up a little bit more exposed to rum overall rather than, than tequila itself. Uh, but here in California, I fell in love with tequila, sort of became my drink of choice. Um, originally, the, the, the idea behind Nosotros Tequila um, started from a class. I was taking a class that focused a lot on pitching. Uh, so the premise was coming up with a business idea that had nothing to do with technology. Uh, I went out that night, bought a tequila drink, saw people buying tequila, um, sparked some interest, looked into the, the industry, ended up pitching the idea. And... Um, a few weeks went by and I kept on thinking about it and thinking about it. And it just got to the point where uh, I wanted to figure out if, if there could actually be an opportunity in the market for it. Uh, so I went down to Mexico, spent about a month over there, just learning about the process of, of, of how tequila works and operates, everything, the chemistry behind the uh, fermentation distillation, uh, really understanding how to play with uh, different taste profiles and the, the wide range of agave flavors and everything that has to do with tequila. Um, Came back to LA, uh, did a few tastes with some friends, went over to one of my best friends who was a, a finance uh, student at the time, Mike, Michael Arbanas. Uh, and I told him, hey man, let's let's put this together. And um, by the time I was about to graduate, we had a, a formula that we had made, a bottle that we had put together. Uh, and it just came down to figuring out two things, which was uh, my visa. So being able to stay in the US and then some funding. Uh, so got working into a little bit of the visa and then applied for a loan from Bank of America, which was enough to uh, just get our first production into place. Uh, and in January of 2017, we hit market for the first time. Uh, the first four or five months of it uh, were absolutely brutal. Uh, nothing was really working at all. And, um, you know, I think Andrew kind of went at it for a second, but it's, it's our industry is really, really controlled by a lot of distributors and big players in the market. Um, and there's a steep learning curve there. But then uh, we ended up winning an award uh, from the San Francisco World Spirit Competition, which is a pretty well regarded competition in, in our in our category. Um, and that sparked a lot of interest from uh, boutique restaurants all throughout LA and Southern California. And, you know, we got a couple of retailers that sparked in, interest in us. Um, to sum it up, we've been in business now for, for we're closing our fourth year. Uh, we've grown grown pretty much 100% uh, every year and year uh, since. We have um, four SKUs in the market, a Tequila Blanco, a Reposado, uh, um, under the Nosotros brand, uh, a Nosotros Mezcal, which launched about three three months ago. And then uh, about a, two weeks ago, we launched our fourth product, which is an Añejo in a collaboration with, with Tesla, uh, Tesla Tequila, that's that um, is out, that's uh, limited quantities. and. Uh, we went through that already, which was which was awesome. Um, but yeah, overall, still self-distributed company. Uh, we have over over fifteen hundred different partners uh, throughout California, Chicago, Illinois, and a couple of countries, uh, Honduras and Costa Rica. And uh, that's nosotros in a in a nutshell. Okay, so that that bottle you made with Tesla, how many how many did you make? It was like sold out in a second. Yeah, we can't we can't disclose that yeah. publicly and, yet. And then it was like. 250 bucks for a bottle or something, right? Some ridiculous price. Yeah, 250 dollars. Not ridiculous at all when you <laughs> when you see how much uh, the bottle costs actually to make. <laughs> yeah, took us a, took us a pretty penny. By the way, Carlos is tomato, so that the taste competition he won was a big deal. Um, from what I remember, you were like on your last few dollars, and you sent the bottle to the competition, and then you won the thing. Yeah, it was a it was a bit of a hail mary at the time. We had a uh, two thousand dollars left in the bank account, and and to be completely honest, I was pretty much getting ready to pack up my bags and head back to Costa Rica. Uh, and there was five hundred dollars to to get into the competition. So it was let's see if this works out. Uh, but yeah, we came on top of of a lot of like really well established brands throughout time. Everything from uh, you know, Eruda, Siete Leguas, um, Casamigos, a lot of the, the, the guys that were kind of getting a lot of the buzz. Um, so it was awesome. You know, from, from there we were, um, it kind of gave us that validity, validation from, from an outside perspective. Yeah. 
in the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, I can I know is is one of the top most prestigious and most well respected spirits competitions in the world. So that's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's Christian business and beats out everybody. So it's, it's like amazing, crazy, amazing, amazing story. Um, all right, let's go to. I'm, I'm going by the way, sort of by seniority. I should have started with Charles, Charles, Charles first, but uh, you know, Andy was close. And then uh, let's go to now Sophie and Jake, okay, uh, with the craft mix. Yeah. So hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see everyone again. And to all who are watching, thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute roller coaster. The idea of craft mix started in the classroom. As simple as that, um, we, none of us knew really anything about the spirits industry, nothing about the cocktail mix industry. We're a bit different than anyone else on the panel here because we don't sell alcoholic products. We sell cocktail mixes that come in a powdered form. Um, we have our new packaging. Here's our new variety pack. They're coming yes, out finally. on Monday. <laughs> so it's been a, a long time. Um, it's well overdue. But anyway, I guess, you know, how we got started and what we pride ourselves on is we're really a business that started in the kitchen. You know, Sophie and I, neither of us, came from, you know, families, you know, uh, you know, with the spirits background, or we didn't know anything about CPG at all going into this business. We literally started in our kitchen, putting in a hundred bucks each. So that's what I really pride ourselves on is that we started this business at nothing and kids all the time, you know, students, they come and ask us and they say, well, how do I start a business? I don't have 10,000. I don't have a hundred thousand. I don't have a million dollars. And you know, that's the beauty of what we did with this business is we started it on a hundred bucks. So that was back in, wow, 2017. Um, we were making it in our own kitchen, uh, tasting it ourselves, tasted terrible at the time. Uh, we got drunk every night, six months, just drinking it, tasting bad, thinking we got the formula right, didn't get it right. We'd see the next morning that we were just drunk and it didn't actually taste good. Um, that was most of 2017. We realized we can't make this on our own. Um, after, even though we got the flavors tasting pretty good, we realized, okay, we're not going to make thousands of packets of pe for people to sell. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's when in 2018, we set up an entire supply chain. Um, and of course that costs money, you need capital to be able to do that. So then we're lucky enough to raise a Kickstarter to get ourselves on our feet. Um, that Kickstarter was just from friends and family. Every single person we had ever met in our entire life, professor, friend, family, um, anyone that you had ever collected a business card at a conference once, you email them. So that raised us about $20,000, got us on our feet to do our first production run. And we finally hit the market in the beginning of 2019. So we haven't even been selling um, for two years yet. Uh, yeah, I think our first sale is probably February of 2019. So because we got so, we had such a successful Kickstarter campaign, we were able to go to our network and raise a small pre-seed round. Um, and that really helped us get through all of 2019 and our expansion there. Like all businesses, the first six months make you want to quit because they're so brutal and you see no traction. And you're just trying to sell so hard and trying to do ads. But because your product's so new, it just there's no traction because no one's ever heard of it yet. Um, we had a product that didn't look as pretty as this and didn't taste as good as this either. It was actually pretty poor looking back now at what we used to sell. But in the latter half, oh, what's up? Uh, that's what I kept saying. <laughs> what? That, that's what, what I kept saying about your look of the product. Of course, well, we had no money. What could we do? Like that, that was the problem. When we originally created the product, we didn't have any capital to do it professionally. We had to do it with what we had. We hired yep. a designer yep. on Fiverr. 50 bucks yeah. and yeah. we created the formula with someone who did it for free. Yeah. So um, the latter half of 2019, we finally started picking up some traction on Amazon. Um, we tried going after tons of distributors and anyone could, who could help us and just got the door shut in our face over and over and over again. Um, Andy, we've never met before, but he's so right. The alcohol industry is really dominated by like three distributors, maybe Five, if you can include some secondary ones, but it's really dominated by those guys. Mm -hmm. And if you're not with them, you're not going to get distribution anywhere. So we were like, okay, we can't get into any doors. We've been trying for months. Let's focus online. Um, we focused on Amazon for the end of 2019. We saw our sales uh, go up almost a thousand percent from October to December, and then continued growing through all of 2020. Um, the pandemic hit and that brought sales even higher. 
because people are at home and they still want to enjoy delicious drinks, um, but they don't know how to make them. They don't want to go to the grocery store. They just want them in their own home. So that spiked sales even more. We ended up becoming one of the top cocktail mixes um, on Amazon. Like if you typed in cocktail mix, we were the very first one to come up, which was absolutely incredible. Um, after getting you know, the door shut on our face time and time again for almost all of 2019, we became the, one of the number one cocktail mixes. It's incredible what you can do if you just keep working. Um, so we sold out. Uh, about two, two and a half months ago, we sold out. We were expecting that this inventory would last us until we get our new inventory. But of course, everything always goes wrong. We sold out and this ended up taking two months longer than we expected. Um, but now we're extremely excited because we're launching with five new SKUs. Um, here, I'll just hold up some. They're launching on Monday. They look amazing. They taste amazing. We're just elevating the brand to the next level. Um, and one more thing I forgot to add was luckily because our sales scaled so well in the latter part of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, we're able to raise a seed round to really elevate our business to the next level. So now that we've raised some capital, we have a better product, we have an amazing plan in place. Um, we're going to absolutely crush it uh, starting in December through all 2021. Yeah. I've seen some of Jake's uh, and Sophie's struggles and I've seen them fight through and, uh, and come out strong. So I'm, I'm really uh, uh, cheering, cheering for you and I'll buy online. <laughs> I don't even buy Amazon. I buy straight from your website to maximize your profits. Okay. I stopped just, I stopped doing that for liquid IV, but uh, I, I've done that for all those years as well. Um, you know, actually, before we move on, I have a quick question for all of you. Maybe one of you can answer this question. Sorry, Sophie, did you want to add anything? I no, I mean, I, I think you pretty much covered it. It was just a lot of learning on the go and figuring out what worked and what didn't work. But yeah, I think you pretty much covered it all. You know, one thing that Jake uh, just mentioned, I can totally relate. How do you guys in the alcohol business do taste tests? Like, because like when you, when you try a different taste, while doing this, you get buzz. And then you can't, you can't tell the taste anymore. So how do you guys do that? Because, you know, I'm saying this, but also because Jake was in the incubator class and Sophie and we did taste this. And then, you know, not only we get, we get buzzed, we can't tell taste anymore. And then like, we were tired for the remainder of the class. <laughs> so we finally figured out we should do the taste test at the end of class, but. Um, supposed to spit it out. <laughs> Okay. How to get the full flavor. <laughs> you can't spit it out. You got to get the burn. All right. So people okay. ask us all the time. They say, how do you, how do you drink and taste all day? And, you know, it gets to a certain point and Charlie Press, the same thing. Like you're, you know, we do a lot of bourbon barrel aids and you're pulling barrel samples. And the last thing I want to do is drink it. And <laughs> once you've, yeah. once you've tasted and you know, like, you know, the profile you're going for and you start to understand it. And it's just a matter of, having control to spit it out and you know that you can have a beer then. Damn. Like, oh. Okay. I, I didn't get, I didn't get Sorry that. To kill okay. that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. I'm sure that's just, uh, just, useful. A, a little bit goes a long way with whiskey for me, you know, <laughs> so, uh, and practice. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. I'd say yeah, the I same goes going... to tequila. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. Once you, once you've tasted, thousands and thousands and thousands of beers you don't it doesn't take much for you to realize it's good it's bad it needs work okay. you know it's okay. <clears throat> for, for me at least because recently we went through like a reformulation and we formulated like 15 new products if not more 15 new products we're only releasing four and we also had an additional like a b c test of like five of them so we probably had more like 25 um it's just all about spacing it out because each flavor, if you try too many so close together, they all start to taste exactly the same. And you want to get your work done because like, I don't know, we're all driven people. So it's like, all right, let me get my work done. I'll get my feedback in, then they'll get the next revisions. But you just can't power through it. I mean, we, <laughs> we tried one day of like, okay, we're gonna do 10 today. And by yeah. six, we were like, all right, we can't do anymore. It's, it's not possible. Well, you guys are in an interesting space because, you know, you're creating a cocktail and then there's multiple ways of, of, of drinking a cocktail, right? Like you're, you're tasting an early stage with eyes once eyes dil dilutes a little bit. So uh, I think at least for Andrew, Charlie and I, like, you know, you, you know, 
the taste is, is you kind of know what you're going for and then you either know if you're there or you're not. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's just like, yeah, you taste your spirit because there's so many different factors with us. Like, oh, are you using sparkling water, regular water? What type of spirit are you using? How much of each item are you using? How much ice are you using? So there's a lot of different variables and like a lot of difficulty with like anticipating what the consumer is going to do. So for example, what we're doing with our new packaging, because people would mess up the proportions so much is we're including a stainless steel shot glass. So they can't over pour water, or over pour spirit or under pour, you know, the proportion is there, but people will still find a way to screw it up. All right, let's move to uh, Nathan. He's still in school. I hope he's over 21, but he's got a, <laughs> he's got a new product. So tell us about your new product, which I still haven't tasted yet. Well, you're going to soon, like, like I promised. Um, I actually have some more samples uh, in my refrigerator here. I'm, I, I was talking about uh, how we're tasting a new sweetener in it, uh, in it tonight. Um, before I get started, I just want to make sure everyone's appreciating Dr. G's jokes in the chat. Um, I just think those are pretty funny. Uh, no, but I'm in a super early stage. Um, after hearing from all the panelists in here, I think I'm about to envy the stage that I'm in right now. Uh, as exciting as it is, I feel like uh, everyone's saying right now it's about four to six months of just struggle that's coming my way. So I, I guess I got to get ready for that. Um, but yeah, so I'm the founder of Loom Spirits. Um, we are a 10% vodka soda. Um, we're going to be able to play in the distilled spirit specialty area, as well as the hard seltzer area, given the can size and, uh, its versatility, um, when people are going to be able to drink it. Um, but yeah, just a little bit about the company. I was, um, really just looking at, uh, industry trends going on as soon as COVID hit. Um, I was bored. I'm on the baseball team. And when they took that away from me, I just had to get my mind going on everything else, like literally anything else. Um, and I came across an article one day about how alcohol sales were booming because everyone's inside all the time and a lot of people are unemployed. And what do they do? They, they go, they turn to the bottle. And so for better, or for worse, that, that industry was taken off. And so I got to thinking about it a little bit. And um, one, one night I was just like, you know what, I think, I think I might want to start it. And then uh, there was a story. We were at Easter uh, brunch with my whole family kind of on a Zoom, similar to this. And my younger sister made a joke about how I was drinking my first beer because I just turned 21 in front of the whole family. And she thought I was going to get in trouble. And so she made a joke about like that, it should, that I should call it apple juice, like 21 apple juice. And I don't know, just got kind of got my brain going, ended up finding the name Loom Spirits. Um, looking out at kind of a, the city. I live on a hill. So I was looking out at uh, seeing the city lights and I thought of illuminate. Um, and so we, we started going with the, with the branding with that. Um, I ran a Kickstarter campaign in August of this year, uh, ran for two weeks and we were able to go a thousand dollars over our uh, intended amount. We raised, I think like $1,400, a little bit over that or 14,000, sorry. Um, so that was really exciting. And I right after that, I was able to put in a production order for my cans. I have 15,000 cans on the way. Um, they come in three different flavors, uh, orange pineapple, acai berry, and passion guava. So a little bit on the tropical side, but they play, uh, there's a lot of variability in the flavors. We have a sweet profile, a tart profile, and a neutral profile. And uh, you can check out we have a few videos uh, of people taste testing, and these are people from my age at 21 all the way to my grandmother tried it uh, at her age. And so all, all that we've been hearing is, is a lot of really good things. Um, we were able to adjust the flavors to meet a lot of their uh, preferences. And yeah, we're really excited. We have um, our drinks coming out in December, like middle of December, the week before Christmas. So we're hoping for a Christmas miracle. We're going to get on uh, some shelves by that, uh, by that Christmas date. And yeah, that's, that's about it for me. All right. Nathan is, uh, like I said, still in school. He's, uh, 
I've, I've, I've observed him since his freshman year. He's a, he's a very talented entrepreneur. You're going to hear a lot about him in the future, whatever he ends up doing. So, um, well, somebody said, proud of you. Okay, good. This is uh, Dr. G. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. G. Okay. Well, he might play baseball. We'll see. We'll, we'll see what, what he ends up, ends up um, doing. All right. Um, you know, one thing I want to brag about, and I'll mention this to my class, you know, when I started this job 18 years ago, I was probably, I'm probably the only guy in the world had a front page article in the LA Business Journal, okay? Article written about me. And it was about my drinking habits, okay? And uh, the, the, particle, the article was partners sober up and start businesses and whatever. I can't remember what it's exactly called. And uh, the article was basically about how me and my buddy, we used to be heavy partiers and then we found Christ and we stopped drinking and we start businesses and be successful businesses. That was the article. And I thought, that's totally not true. I never stopped drinking. So I don't know where this article, who wrote this bad, you know, fake news, right? So anyways, that's... Uh, one of my uh, claims to fame, but let's go back to Andy for a second. So, Andy, you, by the way, you didn't talk about, we didn't get to talk about how you got started. Maybe you can uh, mention something about that. Yeah, and I thought it was supposed to be quick. I know, I know, I, but you know, nobody yeah. follows. So how'd you end up getting, uh, how'd you end up starting? Yeah, it started as home brewing. Um, I worked at an engineering firm, I was in my MBA, had aspirations of doing financial work. Sorry, I talk with my hands too, which you guys can probably yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. And um, you took my actual finance class, so I know you like finance. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it's one of those things we started making more and more beer and people liked it and like, oh, this is good. And, you know, the, the amount of time to make um, five gallons or 400 gallons is the same. <clears throat> uh, so we kept kind of scaling up, scaling up, and people were, I don't know, they were into it. And I think it was in your class that uh, I had this sort of like epiphany where I was like, maybe I should quit my job. Um, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say anything about quitting your job. Yeah, but yeah. it was, uh, you know, I partnered up. I had a um, friend who is now my business partner. He wasn't interested in business. His beer was better than mine. Kind of this perfect marriage that we got together. Um, so it was, you know, from that point on, it was like, all right, let's try to take this commercial and make it happen. Um, definitely a struggle. I mean, I think pretty much everyone said that the first six months, 12 months, brutal. It's just yeah. like, God, why did I leave my job? Um, but then you start to see the light and all of a sudden it's just like, wow, this is awesome. This is fun. It's amazing. It's, you know, it's, it's been a good run for us. <clears throat> well, that's a question I want to ask. So you guys are all in a very tough industry with a lot of competitors, large and small. It's not like an app that can, you know, all of a sudden get a million users, you know, nothing like that. You guys have to build basically one customer at a time. You know, I had a very famous uh, entrepreneur come to my office one day and said, you got, you got a lot of former students in alcoholic beverage. That's like a really tough industry, you know? And I said, well, they're still doing well anyways. But uh, so did, um, you know, are there certain moments you go, man, I, I, maybe I shouldn't have been in this, in this business or yeah. what keeps you going during so those really hard we, So we self-distribute all of our beer, which I think we're probably the largest um, self-distributed brewery left in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things you sign with a distributor when you open, you get nothing, they abuse you and mm -hmm. it's a contract for life. Mm -hmm. The start of COVID, they started hitting us up because they saw our beer everywhere and they're willing to offer high six figures to buy our portfolio. We're now moving closer to seven figures. And it's one of those things The you know, if you put your head down and run with it and you're efficient, you know, we can do better than the 30% they charge us. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of our game plan pushing forward. Mm -hmm. We buy more crappy vans. We deliver to Whole Foods, Bristol Farms, Gelson's, yeah. whoever. Yeah. And, 
you know, that's allowing us eventually when we're looking for that next phase of growth, we sign up with a distributor. They give us a million, two million, three million. We take that, we pump it into what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously like what Charlie's doing is different. This is more kind of a local market mm -hmm. view. Yeah. Um, we don't, we distribute to uh, Oregon with the distributor, a little bit of Arizona, but we're still mostly focused uh, yeah. Santa Barbara to San Diego. Yeah. Um, so it's tough, but you just got to say no, 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 until you're ready to say yes. And then when you're ready to say yes, you get that, uh, that cash that allows you to kind of do what you want and build what you want. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. The, the, all, the question to all the rest of you, you know, this is a tough industry. I know all of you went through really tough times. What kept you guys going? For me, at least, I, you know, as an entrepreneur, I think regardless of what industry you're in, uh, you'll always have those moments. Oh, did I go the right route? Because especially I committed myself to working on my business immediately after I graduated. I said, I'm going to work on my business during the day. And, you know, I ended up working a restaurant job. Like I work as a server and a bartender. And mm -hmm. that sucks when you see like a lot of your friends, like getting these great jobs and you're like, wow, you know, I have a degree too. I shouldn't be working this crappy job. You know, I should be doing something with it. But I think at the end of the day, this goes back to like, Paul Orpola's class, who wants finance, like, do you want financial freedom? And that's what like keeps me going is like the greater goal of like doing something, establishing, establishing yourself with a company, like having that feeling of success behind something that you created from an idea and then having the financial freedom to be able to do whatever you want and not be trapped to like a certain amount of hours and, you know, working for someone else. Yeah. Jake, I can tell you there are many 40, 50 year olds that wish that started a company and, uh, you know, they have no track record of launching a product and raising funding. So you're, you're, you're ahead of a lot of those guys. Um, by the way, Jake's going to be on, was the Price is Right? <laughs> Coming yeah. up in the, December, right? Yeah, December 23rd, I'm going to be on the Price is Right. And then another TV show that I can't say Yeah. Uh, next year. Oh, is that right? Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll at least watch you on Price is Right, and I, I can't wait. Remind us, okay, so I can get a good laugh right before Christmas. Okay. Yep. Question to the rest of you: How what what keeps you guys going? What kept you guys going during the really really tough times? Um, I'll jump in here. Yeah. So, um, I guess for for my business, it was it was kind of a, a long start to get going. So mm -hmm. I tried raising money for over two years before we were able to raise any money and actually we, we still didn't raise any money uh the way that we got started was my family and i literally putting up everything that we owned to personally guarantee a loan to get started and so the the most valuable thing was my parents house and so <laughs> for the first you know yeah. the bank didn't value my dog nearly as much as they did my parents house but oh, well, um, yeah. uh, so for two years straight i was scared that if we failed that the bank would take my parents house away um that was a pretty big motivating factor and but beyond that like my business is a family business and it's got you know my family it's got my name on the bottle and my family name and my reputation is on the line my family's reputation and there's just it's so much bigger than me and then there's also you know we've got roughly like 60 employees and one of the most rewarding moments that I've had uh, was when I've had employees who have never owned a car or never owned a house. And they said that they were able to buy a car or a house because of the salary that we paid them. And that was just one of the proudest moments for me. And it really hit home saying like, wow, like the what we are providing these people is more than just a, a job for every day. We're, we're providing, you know, helping provide shelter and nourishment for themselves and their families. And so I feel a great responsibility, not only to my nuclear family and, and broader family, but also, you know, the, the, my entire employee, all of my employees who I consider family as well and to ensure that you know there is a huge impact that we have uh on those around us and um so 
those those are some of the things that that drive me and and you know there are a lot of a lot of really tough times um and the alcohol business is uh you know someone described it to me uh as being a lot like water polo um which uh a lot of folks uh, here probably are more familiar with water polo than I was, but that above the water, you know, it's wow. it's a gentleman's game and, you know, there's a lot going on, but beneath the water, you know, you can't see what's going on, but everybody's, you know, kicking, scratching, tugging, you know, doing anything and everything that they can, but you just can't see it beneath the surface. Yeah, I think alcohol business is a, definitely a tough business. I think all of entrepreneurs is kind of like that. If people hear about the glory and the fun, but they don't know the sacrifice that people need to make, like putting up a house as collateral. And then uh, what a lot of people also don't know is, you know, uh, the extent they think entrepreneurs are all about themselves, but most of them are about creating opportunities and uh, other people. And they actually feel some of the most proud moments are when employees by the first car, by the first house, you know, that's, that's like a really, really uh, impressive time for actually founders. Carlos, you're in an industry also where every athlete, every celebrity, <laughs> every, like I learned, I learned yesterday, Jeannie Buzz has a tequila now, Again, you know, everybody's a tequila, and like, there's like two tequilas within the lake organization itself, like, so. Yeah, it's, it's a little overcrowded right now. Um, yeah, we're in an interesting spot just because the category is itself and, and the agave world has grown a lot. Um, there's been a shift in terms of how people perceive tequila overall. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, you'd think of tequila and, and for the most part, everyone would say you are either drinking Cuervo and a margarita or, or you're drinking Patron because it's Patron, you know. Um, and and um, I think in the last 10 years, there was a huge understanding of the category uh, at a deeper level to the point where you're actually understanding you can sip it. You, you're not, there's no need to be taking shots all the time. You can actually pour it over, over rocks. Like there's a lot of different expressions. Maybe the two brands that we knew were not um, the biggest ones, right? And that created a, 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 an opportunity um, in terms of timing. And I think that's that's something that's definitely played to our our, our advantage. Uh, you know, our category is growing double digits every year still. Um, there's definitely a lot of a lot of people going in, but it it seems like a lot of and cheers. <laughs> there's a lot of people that are um, um, getting into the industry, but the the it seems like they're all doing the exact same thing. Um, you know, you just raise a lot of money and then put it in a distributor and then try to pay your way into it and and that model works until it doesn't um at least that's that's what we've seen and you know it might work for some people that have the right connections and i think uh, uh charlie put it really really well the under the water part uh, sometimes some people do it better than others uh we try to stay in our lane uh you know similar to to how andrew with um has been doing it we've, we've stayed self-distributed and and that's been something that uh we see as an advantage because uh, we're the guys delivering on weekends. We're the guys who, you know, when, when something happens, we're the ones who are showing up. Uh, and that has led us to build a lot more genuine and more um, deeper connections with the people who actually run the bar programs. Um, and I think that that really goes a long way when it comes to, to brand building and, and kind of building those, those relationships. Uh, so that's how we, we've basically position ourselves in addition to having a fantastic product in terms of quality. We're also a nimble team that uh, we're able to build strong relationships and, and, and be there for our partners. Uh, we call them partners and not accounts for that exact same reason. Very nice. Nathan, when you hear all, all these uh, stories, does that motivate you? Does it discourage you? Uh, how, how does it make you feel? It definitely motivates me. Um, Carlos was actually one of the first people that I had talked to um, just for kind of help and, and trying to get in some places. And um, it just so happened that one of the questions that I had asked him about a uh, potential place to like retail or distribute, um, he gave me some good insight on, on that location. And I, I, you know, compartmentalized it and I went in try and have an open mind and, and get a different result than he had gotten. And I ended up getting a very similar result to what he got. And so um, 
the, I don't know. It, it definitely just motivates me. That, that would be, that would, that would be an easy way of saying it. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of people out there um, that are going to be selling what they're going to be selling um, that are uh, going to be doing what they're going to be doing um, in their respective fields. Um, and it's just, it's, it's an uphill battle. Um, and I'm not even, I'm not even going uphill yet. I don't, I don't even have a product <laughs> to go uphill with. Um, so I, I know it's coming, but, um, definitely motivated about it. Yeah. By the way, I want to open up the floor for questions. So anybody listening, if you have any questions, uh, submit your questions through the Q and a button. Okay. Feel free to write your questions. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Of course. Oh, Hayden's here. Okay. Now Hayden, of course, is from, uh, liquid IV. And, you know, of course, it started out as a hangover drink, okay? Maybe I shouldn't even mention it. But, uh, and then, uh, actually, I was kind of against it when Hayden and uh, uh, Brandon came and said, I want to change it into uh, hydration. I said, what is that, you know? And I, what's wrong with the uh, uh, hangover? And it turned out they were correct. And uh, the hydration market was just growing like crazy. So, um so Sophie, Hayden's question is, has COVID helped or hurt your, uh, hurt your business? Yeah, um, I can let JT answer a little bit more in detail, but JT kind of mentioned it earlier, which is that everyone's at home, everyone wants to drink and we're kind of the perfect solution for that. Yeah. The uh, question from Roberta is, uh, Nathan, do you have a picture of your product? Okay. Well, you know, we also have bottles somewhere, okay. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to, to trying it. Uh, it is in a hot growing uh, segment of the market, right, Nathan? Yeah. Um, I, I recently subscribed to um, a publication that basically just puts out alcohol um, industry news all over the place. Um, the, the figure that got me into the kind of like vodka soda seltzer space um, was that year over year, uh, hard seltzers since their inception have grown like over 200%. And I'm pretty sure that number is closer to 300. Um, and that's still going. Um, but as soon as uh, COVID hit, those numbers didn't stop. You know, the people took their, uh, their going out drinking habits back home. And so they weren't taking, you know, like, I mean, I know it's, it's a, it's a backdrop, but you know, the, that kind of bar set up behind Dr. Choi, like that's, you know, when, when people are at home, they have their own bars, they're not drinking seltzers, right? They're, they don't, they don't necessarily stock a bar with, with seltzers. And now given uh, COVID, they take those habits in. Now people's refrigerators are stocked with seltzers. Um, they're stocked with the more like craft beers. That's another one that's been on the rise too. So, yeah. Roberta mentions that your brand seems to have an LMU influence. Um, but yeah, LUM is basically LMU, <laughs> kind of reorganized, misspelled, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, what is the most exciting thing that's happening in your business today that you might want to share and brag about? What's happening with your business, new product that's kind of exciting uh, that other people might find exciting to learn about? Uh, is that to me or everybody? To everybody. If anyone else wants to go ahead, mine's just that it's growing. It's always it's been growing since uh, since it came out. We're, I'm trying to figure out when it's going to plateau, um, and that'll give me a much better uh, scope of how to do my numbers and my projections and my valuations and stuff um, as as I start making sales. But we haven't hit that point yet, so yeah, that's that part's exciting. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll I'll jump in briefly um, mm -hmm. just because I'm. Um, little time and time too but um one of the one of the most exciting things that we've done uh at least in the last two weeks i think we, i mentioned it briefly at the start mm -hmm. uh was this partnership with uh with tesla we've been kind of putting out there um it's mm -hmm. a it's a fun different partnership and um obviously the the, the brand their brand name carries a mm -hmm. carries some weight and it's um it's definitely helped us put our brand at a at a much larger um, level at a national scale 
Um, so what we're excited to do now is basically just put all the, all the wood into the fire and then continue growing a little bit more, a little quicker. Uh, for a long time, we've operated with all of our marketing and all of our um, overall initiatives as a percentage of revenue. Um, so we're, we're pretty excited now to actually just double down on, on what we've done so far and, and basically take them sort of to a different level in the next eight to 12 months or so. Good. We're looking forward to it. Do so you feel like you have a foundation now to like really accelerate? Uh, great. Correct. What else is happening in other people's business that's exciting that we should be looking out for? Charlie. Um, I'll, I'll jump in and just say, so when, um, when I, took the the business class at LMU uh, and wrote a business plan I you know I think I had a line item that said like in 2013 we'll be taking over the world um <laughs> with yeah. our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey brand and mm -hmm. uh, it ended up taking us 13 years mm -hmm. to actually launch our Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey brand last year um and yep. then right when we were starting to, to get it out into new markets, COVID hit. And so it, it kind of threw us off course. But something that I'm really excited about is getting into new markets with that and doing a, a real launch. And now we have partnered with Constellation Brands yep. Yep. Um, as, as an <laughs> equity partner. Um, they don't, you know, my family and my brother and I and everything, we still own a chunk of the company as well, but they are helping to uh, provide marketing and distribution uh, funding and, and partnership to, to help make that happen. So we're, we're really excited about that and, and um, you know, trying to eat into some of the, uh, the Jack Daniels market that is, you know, that's the largest uh, selling brand of whiskey, uh, American whiskey there is. So um, we're really excited about that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I had a student in the NBA program who actually worked for Constellation Brands. And I remember I, I connected to you once, but he, he you know, I told him, hey, I know Ann, uh, Charlie. And he was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, Ann, that's, that's awesome. Uh, Dr. Choi, I have a question for Charlie, actually. With uh, yeah, Is that okay? Can we, can we yeah, ask please, questions yeah. amongst each other? Yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, with the Constellation has been moving huge into the, the cannabis business as a whole. Um, have have you guys had any conversations at all about like any sort of uh, CBD plays within within the industry or something like that, or even with THC? I'm just curious to see if, if they're already there in terms of because it's something we've played with in the past, at least thinking about it. Yeah, um, I, I mean, only um, sort of casual conversations. I know that they're uh, looking very. I mean, they are. I believe now the largest investor in the world in the cannabis industry so yep. um and i think that they're looking to go big into the the beverage uh business uh with the the cannabis beverage business but um my understanding is at this point um that they are wanting to that like just legally they don't think that there's uh church going and state to be a, yeah, exactly. So they're they're probably not going to be combining for a while. I mean, there is the CBD and and alcohol combo. I believe that is a, an option. But you know, we 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 do think that we have a good branding opportunity, at least with our you know Nelson's Green Briar um, label and like the vines hanging off of it. But um, I was wondering we, if there's something there. <laughs> yeah, we we've only kind of talked about it casually, but. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that they are kind of keeping it separate, but it, it's, it's really interesting and fascinating to watch. Yeah, I can say, uh, I can chime in that we did a hemp based CBD beer that, uh, sold out in a day, which is fortunate <laughs> because we, uh, we got a cease and desist from the TTV. No so way. It's, it's a, yeah, the hemp is still not considered, um, an approved, uh, formula ingredient, which is nonsense in my opinion. But um, so there, there are a lot of people like we're working to get towards the getting, getting the formulation approved on it. Um, we have to tread lightly because they're they're all over it. Yeah, you know what's going on? <laughs> but it's old. Well, I won't lie. <laughs> a couple of quick questions here from the audience. So, uh, Carlos, for some, did you know that uh, the tequila Tesla tequila was being sold for like thousand dollars in the secondhand market? 
Yeah, we saw we saw some of those. It's it's funny. Um, you, got, you got something there. It's part of a limited supply. You know, when you create, uh, you have only so much, and you put it out there, and it goes quickly. People get excited about it. And how did it get um, started? By the how did that partnership get started? Um, well, we we had a bit of a pre existing relationship with them in terms of doing events with them, uh, just because uh, obviously the 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 crowd that buys Teslas tends to be a, an affluent one, and mm -hmm. it was a demographic that we definitely wanted to target. Uh, so we did some events with them, and you know, tastings and whatnot. In terms of, we had a really fun event where we launched the. They were pairing up with a, a cycling team for um, the Tour de France. Um, and it was basically like the whole team was going to be assisted by Tesla. So no, no carbon footprint, both on the bikes and the, and the, and the car. So they were presenting it and we did the full bar, uh, for it. So when the idea came through, they invited us to submit some products to, for consideration. Um, and then a few, a few weeks later, we, we heard back that we had been chosen, um, in, in terms of the quality of our product and that they wanted to work with us. Uh, so we kind of started working from them and we told them, Hey, if we're going to do this, we'd love to do something really special for you guys. And that's why uh, we made an añejo for them because at the time we didn't have a, a an añejo expression. Mm -hmm. Andy, your, your place is near Tesla. You should make, maybe you should make a Tesla beer or something. I know we should hit it. We actually, uh, we got in trouble with SpaceX already, but we've got a great, uh, the boring company is also down there. Um, and do you remember the not a flamethrower? Yeah. That Elon Musk. So we made not a pineapple beer <laughs> and we roasted the pineapple, the flamethrower. And again, that one sells out in a couple of days every year. And pre COVID we'd bring the flamethrower out and everyone gets a pull on it while they're down there. And the, the boring company, we actually got, uh, when they did the, the first running, we actually got invited into the tunnel and they did a whole thing for us. So they're all, SpaceX is the only one that's not very cool. The uh, <laughs> Tesla and Boring Company, they're all awesome to work with. You know, there's a quick question, Andy, when, when by somebody, by Katie Lawson who says, uh, when trying to move past the brew, home brewing phase, <laughs> with hope of start, the hope of starting a brewery someday, do you need a background in science and chemistry? I, uh, you don't, but it helps. Um, I actually had a background in science and engineering, which is why I went to business school. Mm -hmm. And then my business degree is what, that was a part of the equation where my partner had the sort of like science background, fermentation, chemistry. So it's just, it's kind of who you partner with or if you want to do it all by yourself, but it is if you don't know about yeast health and biology and all that, it, it can be a struggle if you don't have somebody to help you with it. Yeah, I feel, I feel like it's just like a, when you start a tech company, you need a CTO. I feel like exactly. you need some expertise to help you out. Yeah, and we actually, we, yeah. we did great, um, you know, the first two years, then we hired a woman who was one of the top brewers at Stone. She opened the Asheville location and we brought her on board and we saw an instant change. She was classically trained in London, spent, I think, nine years at Stone and just had a level of expertise that we never had from hanging out in our garage, sampling yeah. too much beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, this has been really fun, but uh, running uh, out of times. So how about uh, all of us give a little um, advice to aspiring entrepreneurs, somebody who's listening to this, maybe thinking about going into consumer product or any kind of entrepreneurial activity, what's one thing you've learned and you might want to share it to somebody, uh, you know, it's important to, to know for an aspiring entrepreneur. Anybody uh, in any order? Uh, oh, do you want to go Charlie or me? <laughs> uh, go, go for it. I, go for so it. I was going to say, um, you know, kind of based on what Charlie said earlier, the, and I think LMU is really good at this on the human side, the alcohol industry is notorious for abusing people. And, you know, we offer full benefits, health insurance, we take care of our people. And the reward you get from that is no matter what industry it's in, is just huge and highly recommend it to anyone, um, especially in this industry, because I feel like so many people are taken advantage of for so long that, you know, it's just sad. 
I'm honestly getting emotional talking about it. <laughs> no, that, that, that's amazing. That's awesome, Andy. You know, yeah, I, I find find that good business people are good people. Yeah, you know? I mean, we had we have an employee. He's missing a finger. He grew up in Compton. No high school education. We gave him paid time off and uh, health insurance. He started crying. Toughest kid in the world. So just something, something to take away. Well, thanks for sharing that. It, it, that's an amazing lesson. Um, it, that's what something that a lot of, often a lot of people misunderstand about business. And uh, especially people who actually don't have a lot of business experience or uh, are non-business majors, nothing wrong with that, but they think business is all about like screwing people over, right? When it's actually, in most cases, to be successful, you do have to be a good person and you have to treat people well. Um, Charlie. Yeah, go, going along uh, with that. Well, two things. One, I, I think that it's incredibly important to find something that you that you truly love and believe in, because, you know, I, I feel so fortunate that like I, I don't feel like I have a job. It's just sort of my life. And, and um, so I, I do feel incredibly fortunate in that respect. But I think kind of going along with what you were saying that, you know, in any business, especially in the alcohol business, but I would say in any business that the absolute most important thing is relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I, I tell all of my employees that, and especially the sales folks, but really everybody in the company, it's the relationships that you have within, you know, your team and your family and all of the consumers that you are, are trying to sell to. And, you know, treating one another with respect. And I mean, just going along with what you were saying and just elaborating a little bit further, but it all comes down to relationships. That is, I mean, um, that's how we built our business. Um, one relationship at a time and trying to get people to believe in what we were doing and to support us uh, when we didn't have any money and just an idea and a dream. And um, we're incredibly fortunate to have built some strong relationships that maybe we didn't get anything out of them for the first day or week or year even. But now because we have, you know, a relationship built on trust and respect, um, you know, now we can move forward, you know, and do business together and trust that we are going to to uh, do so in a, in a respectful way and and that you know, we're not going to be letting one another down. So amazing. all goes to relationships. Amazing, amazing lesson. Others, thanks for sharing that, Charlie. I guess I can talk to just our personal experience, or my personal experience was uh, just being an entrepreneur, no matter what industry, no matter what you're doing, it's always a roller coaster. Uh, you're going to have tons of ups, tons of downs, and a lot of times you're going to want to quit and there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make too. But overall at the end of the day, like if you're willing to make those sacrifices, um, whether it's sleep, whether, you know, it's a job, uh, you know, if you really want it, there's always a way that, you know, if there's a will, it's a way, if there's a will, there's a way. I know that's just incredibly general advice and I typically don't like giving just general advice, but it really is a roller coaster. And I'm one of the most ambitious, like, people in the world and there's even times where I wanted to quit. Like I'm one of the most devoted people to my company. Like it comes first above everything. Like I feel bad saying it. Sometimes I tell my parents, they say, hey, are you, you know, available for a call? And I say, sorry, I'm in the middle of, you know, three back-to-back -back meetings and I feel terrible about it, but it is my ultimate, ultimate ambition. And there's still been times where I've thought to myself, damn, like, what am I doing? Are you ever going to make it? But overall, if you just keep at it, there's always, you know, you can always find a way to be successful. Yeah, I think the number one formula to success is you got to sacrifice something, no matter what that is. I remember uh, Serena Williams, a tennis player, saying, I sacrificed friends. I have no friends, you know? Wow. Uh, but she, uh, she's a pretty good tennis player. Sophie, what have you learned so far? Yeah, kind of picking back off of both uh, Charlie and JT, one is to find and work for something that you're – truly passionate about and you believe in because that'll make the times that you want to quit and give up a lot um, a lot harder to actually do that if you truly truly believe in it 
Um, and second is, you know, once you kind of go through a stage, you know, look back and help out people that are going through that stage and up and coming. And, you know, if people ask you for help, you know, do what you can and uh, kind of off of that, I think it's just as you're going through everything and business is hard and especially this industry is just stay true to yourself, stay true to your values as much as possible. Great. Yeah. Um, my advice would just be just jump right in, whatever, whatever you want to do, just go do it. Um, that's the only way you're going to find out if it works. It's the only way you're going to find out if it doesn't work. Um, the worst thing you could, you could have happen is come up with an idea and you just like, yeah, I, yeah, I don't really want to do it. And then come to find out two years later, someone just invested, you know, a few million dollars into that, uh, into that same business concept. And you just, didn't really go get it because you didn't either believe in yourself or, or whatever. So just jump right in, go do it, see what happens. I could have done it, doesn't really help. Uh, Carlos. Um, well, there's there's a lot of stuff uh, that I think that everyone has said that is, that is pretty on point. Um, I love the concept of, of relationships and, and team. Um, you know, I think, there was a quote uh, that I read a long time ago that said culture, culture beats strategy every day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that whole idea of creating a family and creating a team that you work with and you trust and everyone buys into the, the, the idea that you're putting forward every day goes such a long way. Um, I will say though, like one thing that I, I hear a lot, especially nowadays we live in this time where everyone is uh, like watching Gary V on online or all these type of things and it's i, I hate the, the whole concept of like self-made entrepreneurs because there's no such thing as a self-made entrepreneur like if there's always one person at least that trusted you that whether it was the banker right. who gave you the loan or the investor or the first customer whoever bought it like there's there's no such thing as that um and and it, it's like just keep in mind that there's no there's no mold for what an entrepreneur looks like. Like there is no matter what uh, personality you have or whatever, like there is a way where you can make it work and build it to your own ways. Uh, Cause you know, for, for some people, the whole work, 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 work thing, what works all the time for some other people, it doesn't uh, find whatever works with you and run with it. And, and at the end of the day, just rem remember, there's always time for a drink too. <laughs> it uh, well, I'm, I'm, I started already, but um, I, had, I had a really tough day today, <clears throat> but oh, a tough, tough week actually. But um, yeah, it, you know, from from what I see, it really takes a village to develop. You know, by the way, to raise one child, you know, I, I'm raising a couple of children, so I, I know. But to develop an entrepreneur successfully, it takes so many people to help out, right, at different points in time. So I totally agree with you, Carlos. I've been amazed. You know, I thought we were going to have a fun session today, but towards the end, I've been amazed at the lessons you guys talked about. And um, I think it, that, that shows what great entrepreneurs you guys are, also shows what great people you are. And I'm really, really proud uh, to have been in the session where you guys shared such incredible, useful lessons about people, about values, uh, and so on. So I, I really, really want to thank you for sharing such useful, uh, important uh, lessons. Charlie, you mentioned about, um, you know, having so much fun at work and, you know, it's, it's not almost doesn't feel like work. And I feel the same way with my job. Uh, sometimes I, I know I'm underpaid, but I also think like, I get paid for this stuff, you know? So... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm often amazed at, uh, you know, what I get to do. And one of the things I'm really happy about is hanging out with, with people like you and uh, uh, learning about what you guys are saying. So I really want to thank you. And I know there are about 30 people watching, but hopefully a lot of people will be watching this video over the next, uh, you know, many years and uh, learn from the important lessons you guys shared. Okay. So I think I wanna, I think you guys have uh, real jobs and bed to go to and all that stuff. So um, I wanna end the session today. Is that okay, Darlene? Yeah. So I wanna thank you all for joining the session. I wanna thank all the viewers uh, joining the session. I wanna thank Darlene for organizing this. 
and promoting it. Um, and I hope you guys, by the way, keep in touch with each other and uh, uh, communicate with each other, share the best information and advice with each other. And, uh, um, and please keep in touch. Uh, thanks again, everybody for joining. Uh, I'll see you guys all later. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you everybody. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks.